Welcome to session 13 of Classic Metal Class. It's me, Greg Sadler, and my co-host, Scott Teruli, a professor of guitar at Berklee School of Music and a gigging musician, somebody who's done a lot of studio work. Both of us are metalheads from childhood, and we've talked a lot about um, things. And this, this, this particular session is going to focus a lot on the 70s, even go back into the 60s a bit, pre-metal and we're going to talk about some things in the 80s but not um not too much because the the dividing point for us the dividing line is going to be the advent of mtv so what are we talking about in this session something that we've been um thinking about and started to do a lot of research on recently which is how, how did bands actually get on the air in terms of television and other, you know, video venues um, or, or media prior to MTV, because you know, th there's this sense that I think a lot of people have. I, I've actually seen people saying, "Oh, there weren't any music videos before MTV," and that's clearly false, not just right. factually, but it couldn't ex it, it couldn't happen because you had to have music videos in order to to pitch a station that would be all music videos. So where did this come from? And you know, if you if you do a lot of research on metal using resources like YouTube, you wind up seeing uh, lots and lots of videos, and you say, "Well, where where do these actually come from?" Uh, prior to, to this. So that's that's what we're going to be talking about. And it's interesting, the more that you research things in music history, there's always, you know, fascinating backstories, things turn out to be way more complicated than the initial picture that you have going in. So it's kind of a, a good uh, uh, thing to keep in mind with any sort of research, right? And actually, every one of us here in the session today is a, a researcher. Um, <laughs> So all of you can can relate to that. So um, this session is is focused on just you could say like the it goes all the way back to the 50s into the 70s when things are really taking off. And it's going to be more of a music history session. I think that, you know, maybe in the conversation, we'll actually engage in some philosophy stuff. Um, we've got a lot of philosophers here in this session. And we're not, we're not so much interested in just like dispelling myths and stereotypes. We're more interested in adding a, a richer picture. Uh, history, not quite going back to the, you know, Otto von Ranke, you know, his, things as they truly were, but at least a, a better story, a richer story. And I got to say, too, one other thing before I, I, I shut up and let Scott talk a little bit, um, the research that we're, we're able to do in the present it's really enabled by the fact that we have the internet as this massive archive that all these people have been uploading stuff to over the last 20, 30 years. And it, that really is a game changer. You know, I couldn't have found out the things that we're going to talk about or that Scott's going to talk about without um, doing a lot of, you know, looking things up on, on websites or on, especially in YouTube, you know, for the videos. So it's, it's kind of incredible that we're able to do this discussion in the first place. Um, what, what do you want to add, you know, sort of preliminary stuff, Scott? Um, well, I, I think you and I initially had, had this uh, notion about, um, well, we, this started with, okay, well, MTV and VH1 come out. Right. And then, and then we said, well, wait a minute. But there was clearly this stuff beforehand. And I think you and I brought up like the Beatles having movies or Solid Gold or Top of the Pops. Yeah. And, you know, this was pre MTV. And then I said, well, remember this corny video like uh, what was the Benny Margolis one uh, uh, into the night. And that was like 1977. And I think although you and I grew up seeing music on TV and one like whether it be a late night show. Um, there was that visual aspect. It was important, but it's kind of like, I feel like maybe at least I took it for granted that it started with MTV. Yeah. Um, and yeah. It's like MTV made everything happen, but it really was more of a catalyst than a, a, a cause, right? Uh, meaning right. that that things had to already be there to precipitate out. And yeah, there were lots and lots of music shows. I mean, I don't want to get into, you know, talking about like the Lawrence Welk show or stuff like that. But I remember, you know, people watching it. 
and, and, and enjoying it. Um, so, you know, where was the space for, for, for metal? That's the question that we're going to ask. And, and there's some key topics and questions um, that connect with some of the things we've talked about in other sessions, like the, the music itself, the records, the concerts, the tours, the magazines, these are all part of what we can call a sociological space of heavy metal that people like Donna Weinstein have, have explored in, in their books. Um, and so we're going to ask about like, well, what kind of music videos were being produced and aired before MTV and why were they making them? What was the whole point of having a, a music video? And then we're, how did people actually see these? You know, um, in some places it was easier than others. Australia turns out to be incredibly important for reasons that we'll talk about. And then how did they connect up with like other things like TV shows and appearances by heavy metal bands? One of the things that we didn't really get time to research was like appearances of bands on talk shows. Um, but there were a lot of those as well that we could have, we could have gone into. So I think we can. I mean, I might have yeah, I might yeah. add to some of that. Well, but. there's there's so many. I mean, you know, one of the bands that we're going to talk about quite a bit is Kiss. And Kiss yeah. were just amazing in marketing themselves. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're, we, we were joking about this beforehand. Lunchboxes, you know, we had Kiss, Kiss paraphernalia when we were kids. Um, that was one band that really knew how to make money on, on getting their brand out there. So let, let's jump into the backstory. Um, you know, we know that there were plenty of musical performances within films and even TV shows. One of my favorite uh, TV shows is Peter Gunn. And one of the cool things about it is it has some really, really good musical performances as part of the short, like 24 minute show. Um, including by Lola Albright, who is his, his girlfriend in the show. She did 38 jazz performances. Um, and she was, she was a singer before she actually started acting on the show. Um, in 1956, Tony Bennett's record label filmed him walking through London's Hyde Park, and they set the footage to his hit version of Stranger in Paradise. So this got distributed. And this is, this is actually something that, that was a, a key idea or a key trick. You would create a music video not to get like all the kids, you know, into your stuff and, you know, make yourself big at MTV because it didn't exist. You would create it so you didn't have to show up because if yeah. you were in demand, and this is what led to the Beatles doing it a little bit later. If you're in demand, you could um, just say, well, just watch this, this video. It's just as good as me being there, <laughs> you know? And so Tony Bennett did that and it got distributed to uh, TV stations and then they would air it. An American bandstand played it too. That's so right. that, that was kind of important back then. Um, so, you know, way, way before metal, people are doing this. Uh, the Beatles, Mark, Mark brought this up that you know, I've heard people argue the Beatles created the first music videos. Um, not exactly, but they, they upped the game in part because they began pr producing these videos it, for the same reason. So they didn't have to show up because you, you just can't be everywhere at once. And that started to lead to other bands doing it too. So it really caught on. But there's another thing that I think is really kind of kind of cool there were um, video jukeboxes back in the 1950s, the late 50s. So there were, there were two companies. One was a, a, a Italian, um, and they, they developed the Cinebox. And then there was the Scopitone that came out in France. And the Scopitone made it over here to the United States. And a lot of artists kind of felt ambivalent. They didn't want to put their stuff into these video things. Um, but Nancy Sinatra did. And you can actually, if you could just go online, you can find her, um, these boots are made for walking in a video that is designed specifically to be played on Scopitone. So I guess the way that it worked is you'd go and you'd you know, put your quarters in or whatever it was. And you'd, I mean, with a regular jukebox, you'd put it on and walk away so that you could uh, go dance or, you know, listen to the music or sit at the bar. I guess with this, you had to like look at it. <laughs> you know? right. So yeah, uh, it's kind of an interesting idea. And again, way, way before metal. Um, there were there were a couple other things that I think are important in this history. Um, 
in the 19, in, in 1970, so like, you know, a long, long time before we actually started paying attention to music, there was this show, Now Explosion, and it ran on Atlanta's independent channel 17, and it was a, a weekend program, so it ran for 28 hours, and the conception was that um, it would be like, you'd have a couple DJs, and they would just like keep plugging away at it, and then I hit the sack or something like that and come back and chit chat, so this is like pre-MTV, um, you know, sort of like the MTV format before MTV. And they did a lot of cool things. One was they would take these uh, official promotional, and, and the word that they use is clips. Instead of you know videos, they called them all clips. And then there were also a whole bunch of unauthorized videos. There was an art scene in Atlanta that had you know like film students. And so they would do the sort of thing that people do on YouTube now, which is you take a track and then you put your own artwork to it. You put your own stuff to it, right? Which is totally unauthorized. You know, the band um, might be happy with it, might not be happy with it. And so they did it. And then it got syndicated to a bunch of other locations, Charlotte, Sacramento, Boston, Los Angeles, uh, New York, San Francisco, but it, but it, it, it folded. So it, it's one of those things. And Scott, you can point out all sorts of examples of this where it, it's time just hadn't come. You know, there weren't, a, there wasn't what needed to be in place. You know, you think about so many musical movements and um, technology that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's now, you know, old hat, but, but at the time it just, people weren't ready for it and uh, it didn't stick. I mean, are there other examples that you can think of offhand of things like that? Um, well, I mean, we see it big time now. I mean, it's interesting that you okay. point out that this happened before, right? Yeah. But like so let's say you look up a tune and i think i said this to you like oh is it whatever a uh an udo tune or something but some fan would take it and so now the problem is like i'll have students say stuff and they'll go that's not the video that's just somebody that put a bunch of they made their own video out of it yeah um and so it's it's kind of interesting that this is this started way before um in, in authorized unauthorized um, just kind of going up and, uh, you know, I, and I actually, as, as I'm growing up, I don't remember that. Like this we is an weren't exposed to it because yeah. um, you had to, you had to be in the right place at the right time. I think like New York or, you know, um, the, 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 the West coast, maybe we would have, that would, that would have been on our radar, but growing up in the Midwest, right. You know, um, I did. You, you weren't going to see that. And, and really our main exposure to music videos, I would say came through MTV, you know, once that, that was available. Um, but there's this yeah. fascinating stuff going on prior to MTV. There's, there's one other video too, that I want to talk about. That's a little bit off the wall. And we've talked about this in some other sessions, particularly in relation to Ronnie James Dio and the black right. Sabbath, Deep purple thing. So there was a rock opera called the butterfly ball and the grasshoppers feast and originally it was supposed to be john lord's project but roger glover ended up taking it over because john lord got cut busy with stuff it was it, it was first a concept album and then it was a live rock opera and then it got set to video and a, a cartoon right? and the best part about this is you've got all these like big name stars who are circling around the the you know Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, and other things axis, um, singing at it like Ronnie James Dio or David Coverdale, and, and you know musicians playing, but it's like a frog hopping around. So the Ronnie James Dio part that became very very popular is this frog playing basically like a you know an old lute and singing this kind of schmaltzy song about about love um it's uh what was i'm trying to find the the actual name uh i think it's like love yeah love is all um and this became really big in a, in a kind of weird way um the clip got used by Fran one of france's main um uh tv channels and they would use it for what's called interstitial stuff. So you you know you 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 run out of content. You got four yeah. minutes. Got four minutes to kill. Throw it in there, right? And uh, they did it in Australia too, on um, one of, on on uh, which was it? AB the Australian broadcast 
uh, company, they used it. And it also showed up in the Australian music show Countdown because it became so popular. And so when Ronnie James Dio arrived in Australia, there's an interview of him and the host says, oh, we all know who you are. You know, you've never been here, but we've all heard your voice because you're the frog. <laughs> And it, it, it like, you know, it's because Rainbow was touring and Rainbow hadn't been in Australia. I think it was like 1977 or 78. Um, and this, be, you know, this is a music video. It's kind of a, a crazy, essentially kids video, but it's, it's a really important music video that got probably the most play out of any video in the 1970s because it was used in these, these uh, things by French and Australian um, companies. Um, I mentioned Countdown. Countdown was an Australian show. And one of the things, so, you know, Ronnie James Dio hadn't been in Australia. Why not? Because very few bands would actually make it all the way to Australia. They would, you know, tour the US and Europe and go to Japan, but it cost a lot to bring sets down. And so the Australians had their own, I won't say their own culture entirely, but a different um, setup musically. They had they had shows, and on these shows, they would play a lot of videos. And so the videos that were getting produced in other places would would make their way to Australia. And if you couldn't see, you know, uh, Black Sabbath live, maybe you can watch their video. Now, a lot of these videos were basically just the band playing, you know, with some lights, you know, sometimes with some, some groovy effects, you know, uh, from, from the psychedelic era, um, but they would play. Uh, and, and so Australia was kind of ahead of the curve. And um, I mean, ACDC's success, some people think is, is really dependent on shows like Countdown, uh, not just, you know, having a good work ethic and touring and, and things like that. Um, so, um, what, are, what else should we say about this? Should we take a pause for any questions about, about, uh, these developments? I've thrown a lot of stuff at people. Um, well, we have I, a lot of other stuff, but go yeah. ahead, go ahead, Scott. Well, something interesting, the crossover and you, you, you just mentioned this early on. I remember when MTV started, do you remember if there was heavy metal, uh, most of the stuff was either, the band limps lip syncing into like in a studio yeah. or it was an actual live performance from the seventies. Yep. So heavy metal. Uh, well, I remember the, you know, uh, see you in hell, right. The grim reaper one. Yeah. That was like early on, but any of the heavy metal stuff, it was kind of like, well, we had to kind of wait. I mean, did it, did, it didn't take too long. It's just like a couple of years for really heavy narrative stuff to become, sort of like what was expected so you could for at, at first you could get away with just the band doing its its thing and then after a while uh, and i'm gonna we'll bring up a couple examples here like rainbow you know great example you you see them you know their videos from the 70s and then it's just the band you know which is cool uh and then by the time you get to like street of dreams there's like a whole intro sequence right with Joel um, and very Turner. Yeah, and and like a psychiatrist talking to a guy for a minute before the video actually begins, and there's credits at the start, you know. So um, Mark says, I'm curious, how would you compare the impact on music videos of MTV versus YouTube? So that's a good question. I mean, when when um, MTV first came out, for it, it you know, it it wasn't something radically new as we pointed out but it was radically new for um, the mass audience in the United States and, and in other places, I think in Britain as well. And it yeah, was- Yeah, MTV Britain. Yeah, and it was, um, you know, suddenly you had access to all this stuff. I mean, I remember getting to watch MTV. We didn't have cable when I was a kid, but my uncle John in Chicago did, you know, cause Chicago was a much bigger market and he liked to, he, he was an early adopter of technology. So even though he, he hated the stuff that was on MTV, he had it. And when we were over at his place, we could watch it. We'd be like, Oh, wow. Look at, look at this. You know, um, very little of it originally was metal. I would say in like 1981 and 1982, but it, then metals just 
took off on MTV and it's so dominated um, with requests that they had to like make their own little space for it. But we're going to talk about that in, in, in a, a subsequent uh, class. Now, YouTube, right? YouTube is a massive repository. It's been around now going like gangbusters. What about 15 years? About something like that. And there's a lot of metal stuff that's loaded up there. Songs, you know, um, it was, it was a way to discover a lot of material that you couldn't have seen or you, you, you could have seen, but you didn't have access to back in the day, you know? Well, the, I think the hugest difference that distinction we have to make is the purpose of MTV was to sell records. Right. Right. Okay. The purpose of YouTube is not to sell records because people aren't buying records. It's almost kind of like, you know, artists, even bigger artists are fighting to get anything. Well, put up a bunch of ads beforehand and you can have a fraction of that. So, you know, the, the bands, the metal bands that you could discover and, you know, it, you know, it's kind of like uh, TV. Now you can go to Netflix and watch a show anytime you want. Whereas like in the eighties, we had to be home by eight o'clock to see something. <laughs> You know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, and we had to wait a week for the next episode to come out, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point. Um, YouTube is a vast warehouse where you can go in and get anything that you want out, but you have to know where to look, right? Uh, and you don't, yeah, and you don't have to. Um, the problem is, it was, it's become, it's become that, but it, uh, we used to buy if like you know you see this video of this great band on the new whatever. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're mowing lawns to save up money for that record. And you get your own very, your very own copy yeah. of that album. <laughs> and, you know, and that's the whole Kiss world, right? Where they'd have yeah. the, you know, uh, and now it's it, it's kind of like, yeah, it's, it's almost like a, a library where you have a free library card. It doesn't cost anything for you to see anything you want. I mean, the, there are a lot of bands that have merch yes. on, on, on the YouTube things. But those are the bands that like have their act together. Unfortunately, a lot of the bands have just sort of fallen through the cracks. And, and a lot of the stuff that got loaded in, in the metal scene um, for more obscure bands is really kind of a labor of love. Somebody had an, an EP or an album and they played it on their, their phonograph and then they converted it to digital and then, you know, um, put some, maybe they just put the album art or they put some, some images there and that's how we can hear bands like leather wolf you know um because somebody or dark star or pick pick any of these you know more obscure bands that um now you can actually find in apple music or in other things but for a long time you couldn't as a matter of fact i i listen you know tank the uh the great um new wave of british heavy metal band a lot of their stuff is still not available on um, Apple Music. It's probably not available in the other streaming things as well. And so if you want to hear like the full honor album, you have to go to YouTube um, and listen to the individual tracks that people have uploaded. And some of them are better quality and some of them are right. worse, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's something to be said for, you know, uh, you and I always talk about the importance, you know, early on we talk about the importance of bass. Yeah. So people are listening on their phone or on their computer speakers, well, they're not getting the spectrum of sound that I think we've agreed that is a lot of the sound of heavy metal of having that low end punch, right. even yeah. if it's vinyl, the live, but you know, you're not, uh, I tell a lot of my students like, you know, MP3s through your thing, you're not getting the, uh, the, the, full the effect, sonic, yeah. yeah, you're not getting the sonic experience of what was intended. Let me ask you a question. Um, the, the sort of, taking us way into left field um so going to concerts and hearing you know most of the amps that are there are just for show nowadays and most things are going through the pa and being mixed are are we losing are we losing anything by not having you know an actual wall of amps that are that are really working um compared to you know it going through a pa well we could go back to the 70s and that was you know, the Blackmore, none of those, there was one of those plexis when he had, and, and Van Halen with the big wall, one of those or two of them were plugged in. Ingve, okay. from the beginning of the time, 23 marshals on stage, but two were on. Um, <laughs> so uh, as far in, as- in that, in that case, why not just have like fake cabinets, you know? 
Um, so much they, easier for the road crew, you know? Well, uh, Van Halen did. They were empty. Like, if you look at the old Van Halen pictures, it's like the wall of the cabinets behind. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were empty. Um, you, you. So what was happening was there was a lot of stage volume, or is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some bands may try to go direct, but, you know, you'll see mics in front of the amps, even in the 70s. And what they're doing is they're mixing the whole thing to the crowd. So you're not missing that. Uh, it's not like um, any of the classic metal bands we're talking about, like we're going digital. It's just like the wall of amps looks cool, but a 100 watt Marshall was going to be plenty enough mic'd up. So you're still getting that sound. You're still getting the bass through the oh, old yeah. eggs. I think you and I always said, like, with the bass, the old Ampegs pushing the tubes a little bit is a nice growl. A little, a little Lemmy, you know. Yeah, it overdrives. I, you know, I actually, and again, total trivia off, off kilter. I found out something kind of interesting through watching all these, you know, videos. Um, Lemmy didn't intend to be a bassist. He joined Hawkwind as a guitarist, but he sucked as a guitarist. <laughs> And so they, they, they put him over on bass and he said, well, that's where I found my, my calling, you know, but, and that's part of why he, he played bass, you know, using some guitar things like playing chords, you know, using essentially three tone chords, um, uh, mostly just power chords, right. Um, on, on the bass. And, uh, it's kind of interesting to find that out. You know, he also got to sing a bit on, on, uh, um, Hawkwind stuff he wasn't the main singer but yeah well let's let's uh come back to topic <laughs> yes so music videos prior to mtv I, we talked a little bit about the beatles already right and the beatles some of their stuff was pretty sophisticated um there were some other bands that that did things that are essentially music videos so if you think about bob dylan and that famous uh song subterranean homesick blues where he's holding up the um cards that's a music video right yeah Animals did a really cool thing, um, the House of the Rising Sun. They're all dressed in the same basic outfits, and they're, they're, they're just sort of walking around, kind of looking menacing as they're doing it. So there's no plot or anything, um, but it, 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 it's not just the band sitting there, right? There's some, there's some movement. There's some, some right. d- development. Um, Iron Butterfly did a, a they did two different versions of Inagata De Vida. The first one was in 1968, and it was it, it, we see it in black and white, but that's because it was actually done in that um, red, that old red blue 3D stuff. If you remember the old 3D movies, yeah. Um, and the video track was actually recorded at Ultrasonic Studios, so it was it was it was, it was just in Long Island. It was kind of a high production thing. And then they did a, a 1969 color track of the same thing. Um, Steppenwolf did uh, Magic Carpet Ride. Um, they did a video for that. And there's there's some narrative elements. It's not, you know, it's not like the, the videos that we're used to seeing where, um, you know, uh, there's like a whole story being being worked out or something like that. And then, you know, when I looked at the the big key early metal bands, they they did some videos too. Black Sabbath did a video for Paranoid that they filmed in Belgium in 1970. Very Another, famous one. Very yeah, famous. Yeah. And it's funny, just uh, an, an offshoot. Um, the interesting thing about the videos that were done that far back, so, um, uh, you know, everybody was using pretty much Marshalls, but Orange Amplifiers were also a British amp company. And if you look in that video, um, Tony Iommi's playing through an Orange amp. And oh, interesting. To this day, Orange uses that as like, look, you know, the one of the masters used it, you know, our amps early on. And as it turns out, it just happened to be an amp in the studio that, <laughs> you, know, that he, you know, it wasn't his amp. But but it's funny how we go back to these videos and, and the companies are still like, oh, look at tradition. Look at Zeppelin song remains the same, which is a movie. Yeah, right. Well, that's that's actually a great point. I mean, having the video footage allows you to pick out things that otherwise would be lost to time right exactly and you know we used to do that because jimmy page had all the marshals in the movie song remains the same but he had that orange head on the end and we were always like what's he using that for you know what's he using that for so yeah uh, so i mean short of buying a ticket at our young age and getting front row at least with these movies and these appearances 
you know, we could see what our heroes were using. We could see kind of how it was done. If there was a live video, not the. Um, yeah. That's another great point though. I mean, um, having videos as in addition, of course, having albums and all the other stuff allows us to participate in something of a culture that we could couldn't have participated in, you know, 1970, I was born, right. Um, and so, you know, obviously, <clears throat> I, I didn't know anything about Black Sabbath until I was a good bit older. I, I, it really the first heavy metal bands that I ran across were probably uh, ACDC and Kiss, you know, and there's debates about whether they're truly heavy metal or not, but I, I'm willing to call them that. Yeah. Um, but you know, so going going on with this, the Black Sabbath, they had a couple other really important ones too. They did Iron Man, um, which is the band just playing, but some trippy psychedelic images backdropped in there. So it's not just the band playing. Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, actually, it's 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 a terrible video, but it's a video. <laughs> <laughs> it's the band playing, right? And then they have like, you know, a dog. They have hiking. They have like shooting arrows. One of them shoots an arrow into the other guy. Um, they have a lot of like focus on the faces. There's uh, there's uh, Bill Ward drinking a beer, a big style of beer. And, you know, it was I guess it was felt like that was like, you know, capturing something important. They also had a, another one that made a lot of rounds, NIB, which is probably one of my favorite Sabbath songs. You know, I love that. Too. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, so there's yeah. there's a video of them playing it. And this is a live video, right? Uh, uh, Paris 1970. Um, and so you, you got kind of like the whole gamut with Black Sabbath, really early Black Sabbath. They don't do a hell of a lot of other videos throughout the 70s. But once MTV comes on, they start doing them. Like think about Trashed off of the 1983 uh, Born Again. There's a whole story there. And it's not, again, not a great video in terms of production. Right. That album, unfortunately, wasn't a great album in terms of production. But it's, it's doing what, what videos did. UFO uh, had some some interesting ones, um, and again, early stuff in the seventies, right? Boogie. If you've ever heard Boogie for George, there's a, a one of the, one of the shows that we're going to talk about, Beat Club. It was a German show. They did a thing with uh, the band on stage, and they have all this crazy trippy background stuff going on that must have taken a lot of uh, lights expertise at the time. And, you know, you can imagine this being played in bars and, and places like that. Um, they had um, another one from their early stuff, Prince uh, Kaijuku off of UFO 2, um, black and white band playing with groovy visual effects. Um, Uriah Heep got into it, um, again, off of a, a, a band show, another German band show, the Lady in Black is one that you can find, which is really well, quite well done. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny to see some of the people dancing um, to, to this stuff, because, it, you know, if you think about uh, metal sensibilities, how much they've changed. Deep mm -hmm. Purple um, has a video of Highway Star. And yep. there's also this like important live smoke on the water recorded um, video in, in Japan uh, that would circulate around. And then I, I found Hawkwind has uh, from the, the Lemmy era with Talia too. Uh, if, 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 if you don't know the story of Talia uh, with, with Hawkwind, she was a dancer who just sort of like showed up and started dancing. And she was uh, um, very tall, very busty and often would take off all of her clothes. And there's a really funny story that's told by I can't remember who it is, but he says that like she, you know, she, it was the early seventies. She would dance around naked or with body paint. And after a while, people didn't really pay attention to that. They would actually watch her. She went to put on her clothes and that would be the thing that they would be focusing on. So that was like in Hawkwind's really, you know, uh, uh, CD era. And there's a, a video of silver machine that was a promo used for top of the pops. And it's got um, Lemmy playing and singing, bubbles, crowd shots. So a lot of visual elements that, that you know, take you beyond just the, the, the music track, right? Or just the concert experience. Um, you know, then we get to some bands that people don't consider metal anymore, but were in the 1970s associated with heavy metal. Grand Funk Railroad, um, they have a, a video for We're an American Band. And it's the band playing. But then it's also them riding around on dirt bikes, on motorcycles. There's even a sequence with a horse for one guy. 
um, arguably there's no narrative there, but it, you know, it's like, look at how cool we are getting around. Um, and then there's queen Bohemian Rhapsody mm. is that was a video that, that again, developed in part because they wanted to play it on top of the pops and the band did not think that they would be able to do anything like the choreography they wanted to. So they had it done with a video. And it, it's the, the iconic stuff that, you know, with the faces, right? All showing up together in the choral parts. Now we're getting to a level of sophistication that goes beyond just a band on a stage or guys riding around on motorcycles or something like that, right? And then we get to kiss. And here we, we have something quite different. They started doing promo videos all the way back back in 1975 for rock and roll all night. And then if, if you haven't seen Hard Luck Woman, which is one of the few tracks that Peter Chris sings on, um, 1976, it's, it's focused on him at the drum set. And it's a very, you know, I mean, it's, it's not as schmaltzy as Beth, I would say, but it's, it's pretty close. What would you say, Scott? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, give, it a, we'll give it a tie there. Yeah, I mean, wasn't wasn't Peter Chris responsible for Beth too? I think, um, or am I mixed up about that? Wasn't well, he I, the writer on that one? You know, I I don't know that. I I don't know if it was like you know I want to sing a song or, yeah. Well, once it, you know, once he was gone, they didn't do it forever. And now, what's his name has been singing it. The um, why why did I forget that? Paul Stanley, I think, right. No, Is the drummer. Um, oh, does he? Uh, t uh, Tom, not Tommy Thayer, uh, Eric no. Carr. Eric, nope. Nope, not. Is it Eric Carr? I think oh. so, yeah. What, what happened to the guy with the long blonde hair? Did he um, leave? That might be a couple couple drummers ago. You know? Wow, I'm, well. Hopefully he didn't blow up like on uh, yeah. Spinal Tap. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> Yeah, we missed that in, show. In any case, um, so they're 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 making videos, right? And you can see a progress in their videos. You know, the stuff, the promo videos for Rock and Roll All Night. It's cool stuff to watch. You know, it's, it's Kiss and their makeup, and right. you know, so it could be an experience for those of us who didn't get to see it. All of us kids, and and yeah, there was tons and tons of stuff. Kiss figure if Kiss meets the Phantom of the Park, um, which is it, it marks it, or Chris says it's the ultimate music video. In a way, it's it's like like um, an extended music video, right? Um, sort of like, you know, if, if you had Queensryche Operation Minecraft, it's basically a concept album with a lot of mixed up stuff. And Kiss, I think, had a crossover with Scooby-Doo as well. Um, there's all sorts of things that Kiss gets their, their fingers into. They do. But what I wanted yep. to say, by the time they get to the disco era, you know, with I was made with, uh, for loving you, sure know something off the dynasty. Shandy. Album. Yeah. 1979. So it was still pre MTV, really, really crisp visuals compared to the previous stuff. So they're like upping their game. They know yeah. that something is, is coming. They're not doing narratives yet, but um, they're clearly doing something of interest. Um, we can also talk about a couple other bands. Ram Jam, are they metal? Well, not really. Some people consider them Southern rock, but they're metal adjacent. They have a funny music video for Black Betty. It's just a bunch of guys out in front of a house, <laughs> like, like <laughs> in a subdivision somewhere, uh, playing, a, <laughs> playing a rock show. Uh, lots of zooming in on the very unattractive uh, guitarist and singer. <laughs> um, clearly pre MTV, right? Uh, Rainbow, as I mentioned, you know, long live rock and roll. They recorded three clips with Ronnie James Dio, LA Connection, Gates of Babylon, and long live rock and roll. And it's just it's the band. But if we compare that to the MTV era, th there, there's stuff once Dio leaves and once, um, you know, Blackmore is able to steer the band in the direction he wants. It gets it gets very very sophisticated um, stories, you know, that are that are being worked out. Motorhead they do some videos, but their stuff is basically just the band playing on stage. They they never do an awful lot. Um, Van Halen did uh, videos, uh, promo videos with you know for Running with the Devil, Jamie's Crying, You Really Got Me. Just just the band. Wow. Loss of Control which is off of, is it, is it women and children first or diver down uh, 1980? Um, do you remember Scott? 
Uh, that would be, uh, no, women and children first, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. That has some narrative. Um, it's David Lee Roth, of course, the you know, ultimate front man um, who's being video, video recorded. And he's there with some, some attractive woman and, and he, he, there's like a whole sort of narrative sequence to it. Um, the Scorpions are another important band. Um, the stuff that they're doing in the, by, by 1980, just the band playing by the, if you look at 1982, um, no one like you. It's an entire story. It's even yeah. got the guy, you know, the famous Forks guy, right? Yeah. Um, now, yeah, like Chris Morrissey points out, uh, Jump is video genius. By that time, Van Halen has embraced the the video, what would you call it, video medium. Right. Uh, it's no longer just promotional clips. They know that MTV is is the way to go. Judas Priest is kind of a funny one. Um, Living After Midnight has the band and concert shots, and they weren't doing, they were, they were doing video appearances. We we're going to talk about some of these shows that they were on, but they weren't doing videos for videos. Breaking the Law, which is off of the same album, there's an entire narrative. If you haven't seen the video for it, it's, it's, it's really something. Um, it's kind of cheesy from today's standards, but I think it actually kind of holds up. It's got the band. First of all, it's got Rob Halford, you know, riding around singing about how he's out of work and down. He's in a car and he looks, you know, like he's, he's kind of unhappy. Um, <laughs> and then the band robs a bank with their guitars. <laughs> I mean, you can't, you know, whoever came up with this, it's, it's really quite great. Um, and then, you know, 1981, the year that MTV is starting to come out, they do heading out to the highway and first the band is playing in front of a painted desert backdrop like a southwest sort of scene and then there's a road race with classic cars with rob halford being the guy waving the flag and stuff like that so they they knew what they were doing video wise before mtv really starts to to offer them new things i mean it's not as sophisticated as what they're doing on um you know, 1983, um, uh, um, 1984, 1985, uh, and blanking, we got Defenders of the Faith, Screaming for Vengeance, and Turbo, right? Those, those albums, they're really upping their game as well. Rush did an interesting uh, thing for Tom Sawyer. If you haven't seen that video, it's well yeah. worth checking out because Geddy Lee plays three three things it, it's like shooting back and forth between the band and they're in a studio that's in a house and you can see the outside which is all winter and uh, getty lee is singing he's playing bass and he, he's also playing the keyboards yeah. um kind of a captivating composition i always really liked that video and you know the story behind that that's their famous studio that they re recorded their albums mm. in. yeah i didn't know that Okay. So um, there was a certain thing that was for fans that were we were kind of invited into the studio um, that we've only heard about. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, like on the album cover, I don't know if you had the album. It would have kind of pictures of them in that studio, like in the past albums. And for once, now we see them sitting in there, which I think you know is the album that put all their exper all their experimenting together. Yeah. Into, you know. You know, in the past, it was like weird time changes, this, this, they're experimenting. But yeah. on that album, there's a lot of odd time signature, but it goes with the lyrics. It goes with the song. So as a kid, I didn't realize there was any weird time shifts. So I, I it kind of came together and it was like a perfect. I think it's great that you brought them up because that was like a, a really cool one. I think that's a really great point, though, that you're making about it, it's inviting the the fan right? Because heavy metal has always been about the connection between musician and fan, um, as opposed to some other genres where maybe the fans aren't as, as uh, valued and creating community right. isn't as valued. So bringing them into your studio, that's really quite interesting. Chris Morrissey points out, uh, less studio, more in Heights, Quebec. Um, demolished oh, yeah. in 2020. Oh, interesting. You're right. I, I, Thank you, Chris. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's right. And and in, in, in not to stop this, but you've left out one of the most uh, 
Re- I want to say ridiculous <laughs> videos, but <laughs> so ridiculous is funny would be Motley Crue's Too Young to Fall in Love. Oh. Now, this, now this video, um, ha- they go in, uh, Motley Crue in their full leather, and they're trying to save a woman. And yeah. there's all these ninjas that are like doing sword <laughs> things like this. And like Nikki Six would just go punch the guy in the face and he'd be knocked out. And yeah. it was kind of like they could barely move in their clothes, but like ninjas couldn't stop them. And but by this time, we're like heavily into the MTV era, right? That's right. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, you know, technically Motley Crue could have created a music video with their uh, early 1981, not full al- album, right? Uh, it was an EP, but I don't think they did. It's, I couldn't, I, I didn't see any, any, I mean, they have, there's video footage of them playing in, in like um, clubs and stuff. Right. Right. Um, but the band that I really wanted to get to sort of like bring this to a close with is ACDC. Interestingly, they, they were ahead of their time and then they moved away from narrative because if you look at, there's like three videos that are really, I would say iconic. Um one is them playing It's a Long Way to the Top uh, on, on TV, in studio. And that one, it doesn't have a narrative, but watching Bon Scott like stop and then play the bagpipes, that, that's got this visual element to it. And then all the kids are dancing around them. But they have two uh, videos, that, and these would be playing on that countdown show, Jailbreak. So Jailbreak is 1976, and it is a full narrative, right? It starts out with Bon Scott singing and all that. And the different band members play different roles. Some of them are guards, some of them are prisoners, and there is a jailbreak that takes place. (laughs) And there's like, you know, killing and stuff like that. And then there's Let There Be Rock, which has Bon Scott dressed up like basically like a, a, a priest. And he's preaching a sermon, which is a story if you've ever heard it there's like a litany of like first there was this and then this happened and then this happened it's almost like the easter um litany in in uh you know churches um first this happened then this happened and 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 he's he's reciting something that's secular but it's in a poking fun at religious way and it, it cuts to shots of the band but a lot of it is bon scott at the pulpit um so it's not so much that there is a narrative like guys running around doing stuff like, you know, breaking the law, you know, robbing a place or right. uh, jail, but there is a narrative that somebody is in costume telling you about. When you look at the stuff that they're doing in 1979 or with Back in Black in 1980, it's just band performances it, and it's cool stuff, but they stop doing narrative. And I, I don't know why. I, I mean, I'm sure there's probably interviews out there that explain it. Maybe they thought, ah, it's a little bit too over the top. It's easier just to like record us playing. Um, well, I, you know, not to interrupt, but like, uh, this is yeah. a great point because, um, you know, I watch a lot of interviews from the year that the albums come out. So yeah, not, yeah. not, not the band now. So, um, they're not metal at all, but you know, uh, Ario Speedwagon is one of the bands that did that. So if you remember, um, you know, keep on loving you, he was in the, he was in the therapist chair and and then they tried to have all these narratives for the uh, High Infidelity album. And then when they were promoting the next album, Good Trouble, there was like a MTV did this, you know, hour documentary on it. And all of the videos were them playing it, not live, but lip syncing it. OK. And they said, well, you know, they had Gary and and um, and Kevin on and they said, well, you know, what happened to the videos like where you were telling a story? Yeah. And, Ke- and Kevin Cronin says, you know, that's not me. I, I'm not an actor. I can't lay on there and talk about this girl that was supposed to break up with me for three minutes before the song starts. And we just think this is more of who we are. We're a live band. We we look good live. And it's kind of a. And yeah, so they yeah. decided every song on the next album, although, of course, their next album after that, they went back to the suspending reality kind of videos. Um, that might be a product of like, you know, MTV not it's not like mtv ever like went around and and went to musicians and they were like you better have a narrative or something like that there was but but i think mtv by its very nature and the fact that other people were doing narrative videos it put pressure on bands to start thinking about how they would do that you know i wonder if it was mtv or i I think the a and r people from the record companies would make the decisions 
Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how much Paolo is going on in MTV, but um, I, I don't. Th- I think MTV, you know, if it flopped, they wouldn't play it. Or, um, you know, it's, I think, you know, everything came from the record company. You're going to show yourself this way. You're going to, this is what the kids like right now, or this is what the, what's happening. And, um, but yeah. we do see, like you say, the quality starts changing. By the time we're, you know, in 86 and 87, we've got some really good filtering on the, yeah, on the, yeah, they look like yeah. movies now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's like standards had kept increasing. And, and I would say also not just in terms of the technical production, but your narrative needed to make sense. Um, I'll, I'll actually, you know, I, we, we weren't really going to talk that much about the MTV era, but there, it, there are some videos out there that are worth looking at because they're so terrible. And one of them is Thor's song, Anger, a song that I actually like quite a bit, but it is probably the the hokiest cheesiest video that you can find and dio did some real stinkers you know oh yeah in in some of the the early videos but this thor video oh it's just awful thor was a guy he's a canadian artist right and he 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 was like sort of the center of the band and he was a big guy big tough guy bodybuilder he'd do things like um Ben bars in his, his show on, on stage. And, and like, he interestingly blow up water bottles, like, you know, like for a hot water bottle and he'd explode them to show his lung capacity. So anyway, it's like a sword and sorcery thing. It's got a wizard in it. It's got a warrior. In it. It's just awful. You know, you look at it and you're like, if I saw this, this might actually turn me off from wanting to buy the album. You know, that's a really good point. <laughs> That's a really good point. And I wonder yeah. how many times that happened to us where you couldn't get past the visual, right? Yeah. The, music's not, the music's kind of clouded by the, um, but, but just to jump back really quick before we get totally off topic of yeah. free MTV. Um, one of the things that uh, I was looking into was uh It was kind of like, remember how Ed Sullivan was like Mr. Out of Touch, but like, here's these great boys, the Beatles. And he, you know, he probably hated the music. Well, in the 70s and even through the mid 80s, metal bands or or AOR rock bands would go on TV shows. And I remember seeing one where Blue Oyster Cult was on when Fire of Unknown Origin came out in 81. And it's interesting because you know, the, the interviewer is as stuffy as you could get, you know, the guy that's hosting the show. I don't know who you guys are. And then um, there was always this element of, you know, he would ask these questions about devil worship. He would ask about, you know, volume. He would ask about the drugs he would ask about. And, and this is what heavy metal was, but, you know, and Eric Bloom were well-spoken and kind of, you know, answered. And so he goes, well, this is really interesting to me because I know you're going to play uh, one of your new songs in a minute, which is part of it. He goes, but, you know, I thought, you know, I didn't think I was going to talk to gentlemen like you. It's like I'm talking to Simon and Garfunkel. And <laughs> so but like all these shows were like the super stuffy guy that had to have these metal bands on because the kid was kids. Yeah, would yeah. You could tell that they could not stand, you know, but it was like, however, the deals worked out. It was individual of mtv you would watch a tv show like saturday night live would have a certain band on yeah or you know in the 70s I, you know and there there were also like uh daytime talk shows that would bring you know, like paul stanley and, and um, <laughs> the oprah yeah uh gene simmons. gene simmons right and then wendy l williams went on quite a few you know and uh i think she was on like sally jesse Raphael or something like that um it was oh, always it, controversial, though. It was always to bring them yeah, on. Yeah, and, and some of them would be, like you're saying with Blue Oyster Cult, like, you know, they, they'd, they'd be like, hey, listen, we're not nut jobs. And then, you know, like when Wendy Williams would go on, she, or, you know, Gene Simmons would go on, then they, they'd like really play it up, you know. Um, there's also the Robert Downey shoot, Jr. show. You and I watched that <laughs> clip with Ace Freely, where he's clearly drunk coming in, you know, <laughs> drunk or shy. Which he loved it. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, he goes on and he's talking about freedom of expression and stuff like that, and actually being quite quite interesting, um, but every once in a while just like lapsing into giggling and and stuff like that. So so you know, I mean, they weren't playing on the show, but um, it, I guess it was a way to like see the persona of 
of bands, right? And I also think the TV shows were starting to find out that metal was starting to be huge. And if they wanted the young art audience to turn up, turn it on for, you know, you yeah. know ratings. I think, a, I think about the same, like metal and punk both kind of migrated in together that way. You know, they were both um, movements that the squares didn't really get, but they knew were important. Nadia has a, a, a point about solitary sun and memory of us. It was all in the ocean. I'm thinking this has to do with the videos that were terrible. Uh, <laughs> topic right um because I, I i'm not sure who solitary sun is do you know that reference no memory of us i don't know though i mean there are some pretty bad videos out there um and the further we go back you know like you like what scott was saying like by six you know uh 86 87 you kind of had to have your crap together in terms of making videos. But before that, it was like anything goes. You know? Well, we, Nadia and I make fun of the Benny Margolis Into the Night video, which is confusing and scary. It was 1977. It's It was a video with a whole story, you know, him at the phone booth. And this girl's like 16 years old. And his father said, leave, leave her alone. And we watch it in horror because we're like, <laughs> this is... And then they're on magic carpet at the end and she looks so unimpressed and bored. And <laughs> so that is that, 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 yeah, rock band that plays their instruments in the ocean. Yeah. That that's a problem. That's a problem. <laughs> that is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, yeah. Let's, 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 let's move back to, to, uh, so we were talking about shows, right? Um, and there are quite a few bands early on that show up in the narrative or background of, of films or TV shows. And I, I, I'm just going to give you a few examples. Um, the Animals we talked about before, they're in a movie um, in 1965, and they play We Gotta Get Out of This Place. And they're, they're there in the background, and they play the whole song. Right. It's part of the, the movie as opposed to like what, what normally happens where the band starts and then like, you know, you shift back to the action. Right. Um, Paul Revere and the Raiders. My dad was a huge fan of them. So, so I, you know, I got to listen to them a lot as a kid. They were on Batman in, in 1966 and got to play like a full song. You know, again, it, it, wow. I think this is kind of important when you get to play a whole song. Alice Cooper shows up in a whole bunch of places in the early seventies, including on the Snoop sisters. Um, <clears throat> Kiss performed um, Detroit Rock City for the Paul Lindy Halloween special. Um, Kiss, you know, in the Phantom of the Park is, is sort of a landmark thing. People love it or hate it. Um, and then there are th like Chips and Wonder Woman would have bands in there. Um, Rick Springfield plays in kind of in like stage makeup, almost like Kiss. Uh, this, this fictional band Antimatter on, on Wonder Woman. And, and the things that were done, it, it was people like trying to portray what they thought a punk or heavy metal band was like. Oh, yeah. Chips has has a kiss like band called Moloch, and they also have another like made up punk band called Pain, and they they're like at Battle of the Bands, and you know of course these are supposed to be the bad guys, you know, um, they're they're well, not the. Go is ahead. it the Chips episode where they come in for questioning, and this is such a setup, right? <laughs> so they, they 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 come in to question some people, but there's a it's like in a in a in a mill, and there's a band playing. And it's like what they I thought so. the rock bands were in. So they're playing and then they put a close up of the guitarist hands doing this real cheesy tap thing because tapping was in because of Eddie Van Halen. Oh, right, like, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they're like, okay, guys, take five. And it was, <laughs> it was like, you know, it's like, you know, okay, now they, they want to question, but they gave this band a good like three minutes of like what they thought like a rock band a cool rock band was and you know it's kind of funny because that probably you couldn't do that today in a show right unless it's actually focusing on that band like the the the, the band leader is an important character in the show or something like that well yeah i mean there was a lot of uh uh mis-editing or mis or like filler or you know <laughs> they didn't quite know how to make their point subtly you know it's kind of like well the kids seem to like this rock and roll thing let's you know let's put it in it'll be cool yeah um but it's it, it's it's funny yeah about all the shows um what's another i just thought of one too you're naming some great ones but like they would actually have well it didn't that happen in some cartoons too they oh, would have yeah. like 
Well, I mean, Kiss made it, like I pointed out, Kiss made it into Scooby-Doo, you know. That's um, right. Um, but I, I think there are probably others. I mean, there were lots of non-metal bands that had crossovers like that, like the Partridge family, you know. Um, yeah. and, then, and then there were, like with kids' cartoons, there were cartoons that were about bands as well. Oh, Josie and the Pussycats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then that um, had to become, that preceded like the band and then the movie came out, what, in the late 90s? And then it was uh, Kay Hanley that was that. And then they actually did a small tour as Josie and the Pussycats. Oh, did they really? Uh, yeah, because they had the soundtrack. Yeah. But think about I, movies like Nightmare, Nightmare on Elm Street, which is where we learned about all the new metal bands. Right, yeah, Doc and like... Made yeah. major bank from uh dream warrior the third one yeah yeah um it, yeah that's a good point yeah yeah i mean showing up in soundtracks well there was that one that um i don't remember the name of it but Fastway did like the entire soundtrack to it and it had gene simmons and ozzy osbourne in it um really it was a horror movie i'm, I'm just blanking on on the name um i think if i remember right gene simmons plays like a preacher or i may be mixing up with ozzy osbourne and that case. i just remember him in runaway okay where he played the bad guy with tom Selleck. he, he was in um quite a few shows okay here and there um I, I you know i mean more power to him he, he's uh i guess he's a multi-talented guy um well, let's 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 go back to talk. So another kind of show that I wanted to talk about, and uh, I'm glad that we have Nadia here uh, because she can offer some of her insight. So shows where bands uh, playing or playing videos featured centrally. Um, there's a whole vast variety of them. Obviously, like you weren't you weren't going to get on Solid Gold as a metal band, right? <laughs> it, it was devoted to a whole sort of different kind of thing. And some of these were like just music shows, and some of them were variety shows. Some of them focused primarily on the band. Some of them included the audience dancing. Um, so the I would say the the three biggest like centers for these were. United States, Britain, and, and Germany. Um, Britain had a, a vast variety of these. Top of the Pops has just a, you know, you, you look at the number of bands that have appeared on there. It's uh, just, there's so many that have, that have been on there, especially metal bands. Um, and, you know, a good example of this cozy, sometimes it would be like, you know, cozy Powell, he was on there in 74 with cozy Powell's hammer that, you know, nobody listens to anymore, but he had Bernie Marsden on guitar uh, in, in that band and Don Airy on keyboard. So, you know, some, some significant talent. Um, a lot of bands showed up on top of the pops. The other massively important one was the old gray whistle test. Oh, yeah. And that was different than Top of the Pops in that it focused primarily on albums. So you'd play some songs from your album, but it was it, you had a new album out. Um, Alice Cooper showed up on that. Jimi Hendrix, Cream did their farewell concert on it. Wishbone Ash, Uriah Heep, uh, Judas Priest, a whole bunch of bands. Uh, and then there were some other ones as well that are worth pointing out. There was one called Revolver that was mostly oriented towards punk, but they did have David Coverdale in, in the early White Snake years on that one, giving giving a performance. Um, Rock goes to school, not not particularly oriented towards metal, but had ACDC and Ian Gillen when he had his own band called Gillen after Deep Purple. And then there was one called Extra Celestial Transmission, which would have have bands play two or three songs live and that one was really important for the new wave of british heavy metal it had motorhead girl school wasted tigers of pantang um venom and then a lot well warlock and then a lot of other bands that are more obscure like um tobruk or chariot or persian risk you know that, that people don't really know that much um, now, Nadia says the tube were huge too. So that, uh, that one I didn't uh, look at. Did they have a lot of metal stuff on, on the tube? That's, that's uh, a good question. Um, I, you know, also in this time, there was a lot of like blending back and forth. Is this metal? Is this punk? You know, what is this? Um, it's, not, it's not as if there was ever a hard and fast um, 
line between them. Well, you know, it's funny. Actually, Nadia was on a TV show called Number 73, which broke bands. Hmm. I don't think that there were more, more uh, new wave bands. I think she can tell you better, but yeah, yeah. the premise of the show is that, that there was roommates that lived at number seven apartment 73. And every episode, uh, a van, a band would, their van would break down on the way to the gig. <laughs> so they'd have to come in and, and rehearse at their place. <laughs> so, so there's a narrative, but it's the same narrative every single time. Right. But it's a that, new band that they, that's kind of funny. Yeah. I mean, well, after a while you'd think somebody would get wise and be like um why why are they always breaking down here you know there must be something about it are they laying out like you know call traps or oh, so she says yeah Go ahead. oh yeah it, it was uh the 80s presented by jules holland and uh paula yates i didn't i don't know of that okay That's cool yeah um going to american stuff um there was one called in concert and the only metal band that they actually featured was Alice Cooper. And they stopped featuring stuff like that because it created a massive scandal when it was airing in Cincinnati, which I guess was pretty, you know, uh, conservative at that time. The station manager yanked it off the air and substituted uh, an episode of Bonanza for the, for the show. And then that was the end of that. But there were two other ones that were really uh, quite important. Don Kirshner's rock concert Huge. had Black Sabbath, Oyster Cult, Alice Cooper, Kiss, Montrose, Rainbow, Rush, UFO, Uriah Heep, Van Halen, and Zebra. On, on them at one time or another. So, you know, all 70s, uh, well, Zebra, that'd be 80s. Um, then there was the Midnight Special and they they had ACDC, Aerosmith and Thin Lizzy. But you can notice it's kind of slim pickings prior to MTV for metal appearances in the American venue compared to the British venue. The German venue is something quite different. They had a show that was originally called Beat Club and then it became Music Laden. And the, the list, I won't read all of them, but there's, there's a lot. So Beat Club had Black Sabbath, Blue Cheer, Alice Cooper, Cream, Deep Purple, Jimi Hendrix. You know, we could go on and on with like these 19 uh, proto metal bands and then 1970s metal bands. Music Laden had Iron Maiden, Motorhead, Nazareth, The Plasmatics, you know, with Wendy o. Williams, Scorpions, Twisted Sister on. And then there was an, there were other like smaller German things. One was uh, Sylvester Tanz Party, you know, dance party, right? And it's kind of fun. One of the, uh, this is leading a little bit astray. One of the funny things about this is when you look at these old videos, so you don't usually think about heavy metal and then be like dance party, you know, or heavy metal, jazz beat, you know? <laughs> or, or heavy metal, disco, you know? Uh, but, you know, these, these music terms were just kind of floating around out there there and i think there was kind of a feeling in the 70s that you should at least be able to dance to this music it wasn't all head banging and stuff like that at least for these shows you know um and so there, there were some other ones you know denmark had jazz beat um austria had had spotlight netherlands had top pop uh instead of top of the pops top, just top pop but they had you know black sabbath and thin lizzy and def leppard and, and the runaways on there and then australia as i pointed out had countdown and countdown that was a, a really important show because it was aggregating music videos and it was just playing that or bands, local bands getting up and lip syncing to. Yeah. Um, and so it, it was a way to do proof of concept for MTV before MTV came on in a way, right? Where, where these others were foundering and a lot of uh, international acts who would not have otherwise been heard on Australian commercial radio would get exposure in Australia through countdown. Sort of like how with metal, you know, if, if we were listening to our local radio stations in the, you know, the seventies, um, we might hear some, some stuff, but there's a lot of stuff that we wouldn't hear. Like, um, you know, you might hear the Scorpions, but not Iron Maiden. Yeah. Um, and so these, these uh, shows, I think were really quite an important venue for for getting stuff 
stuff out for people, just like, you know, with other stuff, like there was a Dr. Demento show that I think many of us have listened to. Oh yeah. If you want to hear crazy, goofy music, well, you weren't going to hear that on the regular commercial radio stations, but you could, you could hear it on the Dr. Demento show. Right. So, right. Yeah. I remember that. Nadia points out Dire Straits and the police both started on a show called All Right Now in London. I, I, I kind of get the idea that there, there was like a vast universe of these, these shows, some of which may not have run for more than like one series um, because, you know, there wasn't enough money behind it or they didn't get enough eyeballs or something like that, that we, we, we just haven't like dug into enough, you know. Um, but it's, it's remarkable just looking at this, how much, as we were kids and didn't know any, any of this stuff going on, how much of this stuff was going on and contributing to this, this uh, entire universe of, of music, you know, at which Scott often talks about how the music business has changed. And I think that this is, this is part of that, right? These shows kind of going away um or you know music videos are music videos really that important anymore um for, well for, people for promoting you know well it's interesting because a lot of people are making videos and they're told you know we're talking like the musical middle class not the yeah or even the big ones are making videos but the videos aren't designed to sell product anymore that is the product and it's kind of like okay you know if, if it's not going to convert to people buying a ticket to your show yeah, or yeah. buy your, you know, there are the merchandise buttons, but there's only so, so many t-shirts people can buy or will buy <laughs> or, or, mugs. Or, or, or mugs or, um, you know, it, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. I, I just wanted to say with all this, um, with the, the kind of transmedia we're talking about, like with Kiss Meets the Phantom, uh, their, their albums, their yeah, posters, yeah. the lunch boxes. Well, the Beatles started that. And I think this day and age, if you offer a show, even like, remember, like, uh, people must be familiar with the Velvet Underground and Andy Warhol. Right, you know, yeah. And they would perform at the factory in New York and he would do his psychedelic, uh, Andy Warhol would be, do his cool visuals. And that was an event that people went to. So there's something to say, like, we're all talking about this stuff, this, this, okay, it's not just the record, how are we going to promote it? Or how are we going to have an experience so people are drawn into our world? Yeah. Well, you know, the Kiss world was a great one, because they were superheroes, right? They were comic book characters, and um, you never saw them. And, and it was kind of a world we wanted to be, we wanted to be in the Kiss army. Right. And, um, <laughs> I think these ideas are all really good ideas now to maybe get people to come in. Well, you've got something like I did a show a week ago where there was like these cool visuals, like almost random, like video kind of things going on on the walls. And uh, there was visual and musical medium plus light show that you couldn't experience on your phone. You have yeah. to like look around the, the room and, and experience or, or focus in on something. And um <clears throat> I think it's kind of interesting. We're talking about all this stuff, how initially it drew people into record sales. Maybe this is the kind of thing that we draw people into venues with rather than, you know, like we're talking about, well, we can look up any video uh, and you mentioned the, the difference of quality, right? So yeah, yeah. A, a video on YouTube, it might just be, you know, uh, not such, it's not so great quality and certainly not an experience. You know, I think about like uh, recent shows that, that we've gone to, I think about in particular Judas Priest. So Judas Priest always has a um, big screen with a lot of stuff going on behind it tied to particular songs. So Green Man Alishi, well, you're going to see a Green Man Alishi, right? But like Saints in Hell has its own sequence. And um, it's, it's kind of cool. I mean, some of them are basically just loops of, of things. Right. Um, but some can be quite long. Um, now only they get to do it because they're the main act. So like we've seen Thin Lizzy, Saxon, uh, Uriah Heep, and I'm, I'm blanking on who else we've seen with Priest. And obviously they don't get to do that. They, they just get to have like the, the big um, tapestry that has like, you know, the band logo and, and stuff like that on it. Um, and, and that's it, you know. Um, so it, it kind of depends on whether where you fit in. I mean, the bands that are touring with Priest are 
what you're, you, what was the term that you use? Like middle, middle class. Well, they're, they're little, they might be a little higher. If you're on tour with priest, you're not, you know, trying to book a gig at your local bar. <laughs> so the, the advantage is yeah, you better not be. <laughs> yeah. So I think if you're opening for priest, yeah. um, you have an opportunity to kick ass in front of 20,000 people that yeah, might yeah. go to the merch booth and buy your thing. Whereas somebody that's trying to play a bar and bring 40 people in, well, they don't have that captured audience. So they're going to have to do something to, to want to bring people in where people are going to go see priests. If you're the opening act, you have an op. Well, remember, we, we always joke about when we were younger, sometimes the, the opening act oh, was more hungry. Yeah, they'd show up like Doc and with Crocus was a legendary one when I was in high school. Um, that was like the death knell for, for Crocus at the time, but it, it was Doc and young and hungry, you know, That's it. kind of, kind of at its best, you know? And yeah. And, uh, Queensryche did that. Who were they opening for? Um, and they just, they were like wiping the floor with the, the main act because they were so, you know, <laughs> well, there, there's quite a few of these where like a band and that, that actually might be an interesting thing to talk about sometimes it's like a topic. There were quite a few where a band would be exhausted, like black Sabbath touring with kiss. Right. Yeah. Uh, and the Black Sabbath guys were like, these Kiss guys, they're just, you know, way more dynamic than we are, you know, um, because, they, you know, the Black Sabbath guys were strung out on drugs by that point. So. Right. That's true. <laughs> yeah. And there might be something, too, about like constant touring that wears you down quite a bit. But sure. um, so so Rob had to had to leave and we actually should start wrapping this up before too long. And, and we didn't uh, get into too many like. Um, anything goes questions from from the audience i don't have any more more um like research material to talk about um i don't do you do you scott if not we can just sort of open it up for general questions and yeah I, I, that'll be cool yeah if anybody has any uh any oh, things they want to say yeah or, or or yeah that'd be great and next time we'll, we'll actually um we're going to talk well, next time we pick up this topic, I'm not sure if we're going to jump into this uh, for December, but we're going to talk about the MTV era. We might actually have to break that into two sections too. Okay, so Mark says, Ozzy or at least Sharon, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the power behind the throne, is someone I feel has really used MTV in interesting ways. Yeah, apart from music, there were things like the Osbournes, which almost foreshadows the impact social media would have on the artist audience relationship. That's that's quite true, um, and I think oh. that's entirely attributable to to Sharon. I mean, well, that's interesting because now we're talking about post MTV. Is the reality show Gene yeah. Simmons did it? The fit was yeah. it Family Jewels? Exactly. Um, although people call uh, tend to call that the uh, what the how many steps gradation to hell? Like you know, first you appear on Celebrity Boxing and then. <laughs> <laughs> level levels of hell like dante you mean or it's not something like that like you okay. just it's, it's kind of like your fall from grace it's like you start grabbing onto reality shows yeah i don't know i don't know how much we all believe that but um but yeah i mean th of course they're scripted but we didn't care we wanted to see ozzy walk around completely in a drug state right yeah bumping into walls um, I mean, I will say this about Sharon, and this is this is stuff coming from like Bob Daisley and J.K. Lee and Don Airy, and it's not about like how how they ripped them off, the people who actually wrote the music. Um, J.K. Lee stuck around after Bob after was Bob Day no Bob Daisley wasn't on Ultimates and he was on uh, Bark at the Moon and Bark so was Don moon. Airy, and then they're they're gone, and already by then they're dressing kind of weird, you know, for like their stage shows. If you see the the, the stuff. That's all Sharon. She insisted on the outfits. And by the time that they're on the ultimate sin and doing the, the videos for that, they just look ridiculous. It's like wearing blouses and it's well, very, look it, the worst. Yeah. It's I very mean, glam, but, but JK Lee looks like crap too. <laughs> and he, and people asked him about it. He's like, listen, I didn't, she told me if I want to be, you know, if I want to be in the video, if I want to be on tour, if I want to be hired, I got to wear this crap, you know, with the big shoulder pads. And, and he had the and, long coat and the chucks. <laughs> Like he was known for his, his, his Chuck Taylors, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and, and so, you know, is when you look, look at the videos, you, you, I guess maybe at the time, a lot of people were like, well, this seems cool, you know, um, but it, it, it was so glammy, you know. 
it, it wasn't Ozzy. I mean, even at the time, it was kind of like I really loved that album, Ultimate Sin. But I remember the visuals were uncomfortable. You know, I think my friends and I said it looks like some old grandma. Look at the grandma's wardrobe. Yes, exactly. And the hair, and it was just, um, yeah. I remember like it, it being a little scary seeing Ozzy like that for me. Yeah. Yeah, there was there was Phil Susan and bass, and I don't remember who the drummer was, um, but they all they all looked like that, and then lots of makeup too, you know. Oh yeah, and it wasn't like Kiss makeup, you know. It was like, you know, no. and it wasn't. I mean, Motley Crue did the uh, on the you know on the Shout at the Devil album, they they did the looking like like chicks kind of thing, but they did yeah. it in a way that was really hard edged, you know. Right. Ozzy Ultimate Sin did not have that. <laughs> No, it was like definitely broke into grandma's closet. It didn't look, it wasn't edgy. It was, what was that thing he was, the, the, the blouse thing he was wearing was like sparkles and. That's right. Yeah. Sequins. Yeah. Sequins. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> I had that video and it was just, it opened with um, the first track was the video for, um, uh, well, what's, what's the big song from that album? Well, they're all big, but uh, it, it started out Not with that dark. video. Shot, Shot in the, the dark, dark, right? Yeah. And then uh, Ultimate Sin video was on there mm -hmm. too, which was uh, kind of a funny video, but really kind of didn't, it wasn't cool for us to see Ozzy look like that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It was sort of a moving away from the from Prince brand. of Darkness. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, so that is what, 1986? Six. Okay. So Around that time, you have um, Judas Priest re releasing Ram It Down, which is still kind of, you know, Turbo Arrow stuff. It's stuff they've recorded for the Turbo album and then put out, but they're starting to get harder again. Right. Um, Iron Maiden had, you know, not that long before that released Live After Death and, and as a video performance as well. Um, who else do you have in the metal scene that's really big at that time? Maybe well, except know. put out Stay in a Life. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. The live from Tokyo, right? Yeah. That was 85, which I love. Yeah, and the Scorpions were still riding hard on a touring like crazy uh, after Blackout and Worldwide Live and then and Love at First Sting, which was 84. So well, that's right, Worldwide <laughs> Live was 85. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, the other thing too is at that time, you've also got like thrash metal firmly established by 86 you know and the whole pared down look because not only has um metallica become big um uh, megadeth is also on the scene anthrax is on the scene slayer starting to move in to it um so there's like a whole different aesthetic of like we're not going to be like those those you know grandma's wardrobe you know glammy people we're, we're going to be like really doing hard stuff so yeah ultimate sin i mean it sounds good but the yeah. visuals <laughs> I, I yeah it was i it was a it's a great great album i love that album and uh yeah. but the visuals were i remember buying the videos like i couldn't wait to hear the <laughs> songs done live and then my i remember my friend and i it was in his house you know we're we open up we throw it in we're like oh what what's this <laughs> you know yeah. last we saw you you were like you know the prince of darkness <laughs> yeah exactly yeah well, you can say this about for, for everything bad that we can say about Sharon Osbourne, she is clearly responsible for him not being dead, you know, and not being dead in 84 and, and stuff. Right. Like because she, she's the one who, uh, who uh, would, you know, make him stop drinking and taking drugs for a while. I mean, it didn't stick a lot of the time, but. No. Well, there's famous videos in 86 of him sitting on the floor and then trying to interview him. They're yeah. like, well, how, how is sobriety now that you're sober? He's like, it's effing terrible. <laughs> and then he goes, I need something to drink. They go, there's some water right there. He goes, water? And like, he's like completely like, you know, I, he, he seems drunk in the thing. So it didn't really last at all. But um, yeah, he was having a tough time with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean what a decade and a half of not being, you know, sober. I mean, Black Sabbath recruited him, I think, in 69, right? And yeah. it was just one long ride from that point on. So, yeah. 
I mean, with Ozzy, you can't even just say like, you know, cocaine's a hell of a drug or pot's yeah. a hell of a drug or something like that. He was trying it all. So he tried everything. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, it's a, it's a miracle he's still here. You know, even 10 years ago, I saw a Sabbath and he didn't seem alive on stage. He was just yeah. saying, we love you all and singing out a key, but. Yeah, oh, well. I think, I think, I mean, there are a lot of uh, great, you know, metal musicians who are still um, putting out excellent stuff, you know, innovative stuff. Uh, yeah. and maybe we should do an episode on, on that as well. You think about like, so Judas Priest, you know, Judas Priest has, has a fairly new album with Firepower. <laughs> Saxon, um, uh, I'm trying to, Thunderbolt is their most recent album. Raven just is bringing out a new album. Um, there's a lot of bands with, with musicians who are, you know, quite aged, who are still fresh putting out new, new stuff, but, um, yeah. And Iron Maid's last two albums, I think are pretty damn true. good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we should probably do something about that, like classic metal bands that have continued on, into um the present doing doing interesting work and they're not just sort of like riding the, the right uh, what would you call it the uh they're not falling train. Train. yeah exactly yeah yeah well um, this is this has been a great conversation um we you know we'd like to thank all of our participants for for your input um i'll, I'll let scott have the last word about the the video scene um and then we'll we'll call it a day well yeah i guess one quick thing is um in, in the notes that we traded back and forth you ask a question that we didn't get to did video kill the radio star yeah and i think we'll save that for next time right we'll save that for next time but i have to say talking about we what we talked about I would have to say no, because there, we, we just said that there was video and concert appearance. Everybody says Christopher Cross, right? He, he was no more, but that guy was making tons of money and he was on talk shows in the, in, you know, the late seventies, early eighties. And um, that, that's a discussion for another time, but I did just want to throw that one in there that it, it goes along with what we've been talking about today, that it did exist before. It just wasn't MTV era. Exactly. So rich conversation. Thanks again, Scott, for, for coming on. I always love you. these conversations that we get to have. Thanks to everybody else. And we'll see you next time.